Um, hello, everyone. My name is Morgan. I'm happy to be here presenting my research on modeling urban activities from cellular data. I will first make an introduction about the background, and then I will introduce the framework of activity pattern recognition with cellular data. And then I will show some experimental results of, of, of applying our model. And finally, I will make some conclusions. So first, the background. Um, according to the 2012 Urban Mobility Report, our city is getting more congested. Uh, in 2011, uh, the average delay suffered by a commuter is 38 hours, and this number is 61 in Bay Area. And uh, uh, the total congestion cost is 120 billion. That is $820 per commuter, and this number is 1300 in Bay Area. And the total excess CO2 emission is 10 billion pounds, and that is 160 pounds per commuter, and this number is tripled in Bay Area. So how to solve the problem? Should we build new roadways? No, because it widely recognized that the chance of building new roadways is decreasing because of the increasing cost, space limitations, and the environmental impacts. So the opportunities lies in improving the transportation management to efficiently and effectively use existing infrastructures. However, transportation decision makers are facing difficult problems to, uh, to answer some questions. For example, which policy or investment can help reduce the congestion, and how will the transportation system perform in 30 years? And tra transportation travel demand models are created to answer those questions. In the recent two decades, activity-based travel demand models has gained more attention because it derives travel demand from people's need and desire to participate in activities. It models how people make decisions about activity participation, what activity to participate, where to participate, when to participate, how to get there, and with whom. It's usually assembled by a microscopic travel simulation. And it has several advantages over the traditional tour-based demand models because the simulated agents can adapt their decisions by learning from their behavior. And it's usually more, get more consistency and integrities across various sub-models. And we can also get more, more detailed performance metrics. And here is an example of uh, a demo of our Smart Bay project from our, our group. It shows the visualization of uh, the activity-based traffic simulation in the Bay Area. Um, so um, we can see that during the morning commute hours, um, people depart from their home locations and travel on the road network and uh, arrive to their home work locations. And during the evening commute hours, and they depart from their work location, travel on the road network, and finally getting back to their home locations. So we can also get detailed um, traffic volume and traffic speed on each, on each link of the road network. However, there are some problems with the current ABMs. Um, first, most of the ABMs use manual survey, and the unit of those manual survey are usually one or two typical days of a week. So they cannot capture the day of week effect and the long-term effect. And second, the data collection process is really expensive and with significant delays. How should we solve the problem? What about using mobile phone data? People generate data while using mobile phones, and those data are sent to the mobile carriers, such as AT&T, the locational-based social networks, such as Twitter, and navigation services, such as Google Map. Although it might not, not be central to their businesses, it's valuable to do the traffic modeling, and it can solve the aforementioned ABM problems. However, the current practice of using large-scale mobile phone data has focused on exploring its power at aggregate level. For example, understanding human mobility loads, dynamic population estimation, traffic OD estimation, land use clustering and classification, disaster response, and special social events. So our objective is to enable activity-based travel event model using mobile phone data. And the first step is to understanding the activity patterns. And this will allow us to simulate activity schedules probabilistically and to model a range of tra travel choices such as the mode of tra transportation that depend on the structure of daily activity plan and the start and time of the activities. 
So the specific problem we are going to solve is that we observe some users and their traces, their CDR traces over multiple days. And we want to understand their home and work locations and the hidden activities behind the locations and the spatial temporal choices of their activities. In the previous literature, there has been model using GPS data, cellular data, and locational-based social network data to model user traces. GPS data is accurate in locations. However, its coverage cannot compare to cellular data. And locational-based social network data is further limited by its discontinuities in subsequent check-ins. Supervised model requires ground truths, and these ground truths are usually collected by menu labeling, or they ask a small group of uh, participants to report their activities. And the nature of cellular data and privacy concern precludes us from using either way to collect the ground truths. And discriminative model are uh, usually more flexible in the model structure and sometimes outperforms the generative models in terms of recognition accuracy. However, due to the indirect nature of discriminative model, they are hard to generate new samples directly. And since we only have about one to two months of data per individual, so it's hard to train an individual model. Instead, we train a global model with shared parameters in a small group of people. Um, now I will introduce the framework of activity pattern recognition. The first step is pre-processing. Um, we want to extract some features about the activities from the raw CDR log. And the, the raw CDR log, log contains the timestamp and triangulated latitude and longitude of the user location. And after the process pre-processing, we want to get the activity locations, start and end time of the locations and the duration of the activity. Uh, to do so, we first uh, follow some just a very common practice that we did a spatial clustering using dbscan to filter out the positioning errors. And another significant error is oscillation errors uh, in the cell phone data. So um, to construct an oscillation graph, we see, that, we see that if a user is connected to two clusters at the, time, the same timestamp, we add an edge to the oscillation graph. So because there is potential oscillations between those two clusters. And if we see there is jumping back and forth between two clusters, such as ABA or something like that, we will merge those oscillations. And also, the two clusters are in the oscillation graph. Then we merge those oscillations into a single activity. And after then, we filter some past five points by the dwell time, which we set the minimum of five minutes. And the second step is to do the home and work inference. This, we also follow some common practice that we say that home location is the location where the user spends most of the time uh, the whole, during the home hours, which we define to be 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. And the work location is the location where the user spends most of the hour during work hours, which we define as 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. And finally, we justify our choice of using LHMM to do the secondary activity recognition. Since we want to simultaneously model activity, location, duration, and start times, um, we want to use hidden Markov model because it's a generative model. It's good at modeling sequences, and there are efficient algorithms for filtering, smoothing, prediction, and most likely sequence construction. And we also want to incorporate rich contextual information. For example, if we observe a user at home and is departing for some activities, if this happens in the morning, then he or she is likely to go to work. But if it's in the evening, he or she is likely to go to a food or shop activity or some recreational activities. So we want the non-homogeneous initial state probability, transition probability, and emission probabilities. And LHMM can be self-adaptive and, uh, uh, and uh, flexible in approximating most of the nonlinear functions. And it has enjoyed great success in speech recognition as well. So this is the LHM architecture. We assume that the hidden activity depends not only on the previous activity, but also some of the contextual information, such as time of day, day of week, and the information about activities in the past. And we assume the location and duration choice of the activity depends on the hidden activity, as well as the contextual information. Now, I will show some experimental results. Um, we use anonymized and aggregated CDR logs collected by a major mobile carrier in the San Francisco Bay Area. And to conduct the secondary activity recognition, we use the weak data of 20,000 San Francisco residents 
residents, which represent about 2% of the population, who showed up at their identified home in more than 21 days, and showed up at their identified workplace in more than 14 days, and have home and work location at not the same, at not the same place. So in this case, we just keep a small group of people that um, it's San Francisco regular commuters that are supposed to contribute to most of the peak hour traffic. After the pre-processing, we can see that on average, a user participates in four activities in both week weekday and weekends. And uh, there are much more variations on weekends. And this number is consistent with the National Household Travel Survey. And this picture shows the density map of the inferred home and work locations of those San Francisco residents um, aggregated at the census tract level. We can see that their work locations, the highest density occurs in San Francisco, Auckland, and some South Bay cities. Well, if we focus on the lo uh, work locations in San Francisco, then it ha mostly happens in the uh, CBD area. While the home locations are more spread out the city. Now I will introduce the result of the um, activity patterns. First, I will show some summary statistics for the daily scheduling pattern. And these numbers are usually um, analyzed or are reported in the menu surveys. And here we show that we can use cell phone data to report those numbers um, in a more objective way. We can see that about 88% of more than I guess more than 90% of people who go to uh, work on a typical weekday. And also there are about 28% of people who go to work on weekends. And this number is consistent with the, the number given by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And if we focus on a typical uh, home work home days, we can see that there are more than 90% of people who don't make any tours before morning commute and 72% of people who don't make any tours during their work hours, and 78% of people who don't make any tours after they're going back to home. And if we focus on the number of activities, we can see that 58% of people who don't, make any tour, who don't make any activities during the homework commute tour, and while only 40% of people who don't, make any, uh, who don't participate in any activities during the work home commute tour. We can also analyze the interactions in stop making across different times of day. Um, for example, we see that having a midday activity doesn't have anything to say with the evening commute activity and the post-home activities. Because the nature of activities participated in the midday, participated in the midday usually it's not substitutable to the post-home activities and evening commute activities. Um, however, if you have an evening commute activity, uh, you are much less likely to participate in another post-home activity, and vice versa. Also, people who do have a post-home activity are likely to uh, leave their work earlier, around 4.30, while people who do not have a post-home activity are likely to leave later, around 6.10. Now, I will show some of the uh, activity profiles recognized from the IOHMM model. So first, the home and work, location, uh, the home and work activities. On the left, um, we have the start times of the home and work activities across the whole week. We can see that um, the start time of work activity is more narrowed around 9, 9 a.m. And there are more variations on the start time of home activities. And this variation is even more on Friday and weekends. And on the right, we have the 2D kernel density plots of start hour and duration. And we can see that for the home locations, there are two, for the home activities, there are mainly two clusters. The lower cluster represents some activities at home before departing to another activity. And the upper cluster is just the long, dur long duration rise at home. And the upper cluster is also tilted with a negative 50, uh, 45 degree. This, is because, this just means that if you arrive to your home location later, you are likely to stay less time. This is because of the usually uh, fixed start time of work in the next day. And on the right, we have the, the, the work activities. There are mainly three clusters. The two lower clusters represent the work activities in the morning and in the afternoon. 
and the upper cluster represents the 9 to 5 activities without any rest. And so um, these three clusters are, are also tilted with a negative 45 degree. This is because of the usually fixed lunch hour and the end hour of the work. And now we are going to analyze some secondary activities. We plot the start times across the week and report some descriptive statistics of the distance to home and distance to work, as well as the 2D kernel density plots of start hour and duration. For this activity, we can see that it happens more um, in, during the lunch hour and in the evening. And it's quite regular across the whole week. And it's quite close to the home and work location. And usually that lasts for about half an hour to an hour. So we, we feel that this, like, this is likely to be a food and shop activity. And this activity happens very regularly um, during the weekday commute hours in the morning and the evening. And it's close to the user's home and, and work location. And duration is very short uh, for about 10 minutes. So we feel this is like the, to be a transportation or coffee activities during the um, commute tour. And this activity is the most infrequent one. And it happens more on Friday and weekends, and it's quite far away from the user's home and work location. So this is a distant travel activity. And this activity happens either at early morning or in the evening. It happens more on Friday and weekends. And it's close to the user's home, but far away from the user's work location. And there is much variations in the durations. So we feel this could be a recreational activity. And this activity is featured by its distance to home and distance to work location. It's about 30 miles from the user's home and work location and happens more on Friday and weekends. So this could be some medium distance personal businesses or food and shop activity or recreational activity. And this activity is about nine miles from the user's home and work location. The duration is very short for only about 20 minutes. So we call it personal businesses. And this picture contains all the urban activities uh, recognized from the cellular data. And another um, strength of the IOHMM model is that we can understand the, the, the non-homogeneous transitions given different contexts. For example, in the morning, the most significant transition is from home to work. While if it's in the evening, then the most significant transition is from all the other activities coming back to home. And if it's an afternoon and the user has not been working at all, then he or she is likely to go to work. But if he or she has been working for hours, he or she is likely to go in back to home locations. To conclude, uh, we used an unsupervised generative state space model to infer the primary and secondary activities from cellular data. And we analyzed the spatial temporal profile of activities as well as the heterogeneous transition probabilities given different contexts. And the generative nature of the model gave us direct access to the inputs needed for the activity-based travel demand model. And for future works, we can try to improve the location model so that we can directly sample locations. And we, and we can try to gain a small amount of labeled data for validation purpose. And finally, we can, start tr we can try to start simulating activities using the model and compare the resulting traffic with the ground truth. Um, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much.